They're crazy, they're zany, and just plain nuts, but they love Jesus. America's Keswick and all of you. Here are the hosts of the Bob and Bill podcast, Robert Hayes and Bill Welty. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for episode 15 of the Bob and Bill podcast. That hymn has a lot of significance for our ministry. Yes. All hail the power of Jesus' name, because on September 25th, 1897, William Ross gathered together in the little cottage, and we're going to be showing you some of the houses and buildings here on the property in upcoming episodes. Oh, that's cool. It's will be cool because we have a lot of new folks that don't have a clue what we are. Mm-hmm. But on September 25th, 1897, William Ross gathered his staff together, had a Bible study. And after that Bible study, gathered together outside of that little cottage, they had a little pump organ on the wagon. They pulled that off, and together they sang, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And that began the ministry of America's Keswick. So that's awesome. Cool. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to, you know, you. last week we told you that the. Uh, we had two swans show up on yes. the lake. Yes. And they are still here. 
And I understand now that they have names. They have been named Howard and Barbara. That's really cool. Yeah, they're really funny because one day they're in the upper lake, mm -hmm. one day they're in the lower lake. And then earlier in the week, I drove in and I only saw one swan in the lower lake and my heart dropped. <laughs> but the other one was out playing with the geese. I thought they were supposed to get rid of the geese. Oh, that's funny. Oh, well. Hey, we're glad you joined us today. We're looking forward to part two of Pastor Sam Sutter's message from the book of Colossians. Let's give a watch. Like the, the point is, because Jesus is ascended, because Jesus is sovereign, because Jesus is a big deal, he's got a plan, and he might not tell you what the plan is, and I might very well go, come on, Jesus, why are you doing this? I don't like your plan, but Jesus is still in charge, and because that's true, set your mind on that. Of all things, that's the secret that Paul gives us. What do you do to connect with Jesus, to be rooted, stronger, closer to the head of the body? Here it is. Set your hearts on things above, specifically Jesus on the throne of heaven. And Paul's already talked about heaven a couple times. You saw it in chapter 1, verse 5, where he writes, he uses this phrase, the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. And now he sort of uses, and this is technical, but he uses a spatial term, above, as a synonym for heaven. Like, think about heaven. And Paul isn't just talking about space. He is, as, as we've mentioned, he's talking about, well, the future as well. And this is fascinating. You may have to chase this around a little bit more. Um, but for the Apostle Paul, the idea of above doesn't just have like a up in heaven sort of dimension, but a, uh, a future dimension to it. Like heaven isn't now, heaven is in the future. And he draws this contrast between the upper world and lower worlds, like now and heaven, future. So when, when he says to the Colossians, set your minds and hearts on things above and put to death, uh, the members of the earth or uh, the, the earthly things. What, what he's teaching us is that our moral vision, what you do day in and day out, should be controlled by the reality of what your future looks like. Like if you really believe that God is in charge and that there is a heaven and a hell and that there is an eternity, that simple fact should influence and change what you do right now. In other words, this is the thing that's going to change you today. Start thinking about the fact that scripture says things like, like life is a vapor. You know what that means, right? The prophets use this narrative that it's a cold winter night and you go, and you see like a, a little cloud, right? And then it disappears. The Bible says that's what your life is like. Life is like uh, spring grass that grows and then Bill Welty gives you a milkshake to pick it out of a garden. Like, uh, here's what Paul's saying. Live your life, set your heart, make your daily decisions with eternity in mind. And if you start doing that, you will find yourself close to God. You, you've heard it said, there is only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. You've heard that? The Apostle Paul says something very similar in Philippians. Let me just read this, Philippians 3, 19 through 20. He says, well, he's talking about people. He says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. And you scratch your head and go, what's wrong with these people? Why are these folks so bad? And he says, well, because their mind is set on earthly things. Like they think that all we got is what we have right now. And Paul says it messes you up when you think what we have right here is all you have. And then he says in Philippians, but, but us, no, no, we're not like that. Our citizenship is in where? And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 
In other words, like instead of having your mind set on earthly things, here's what you should do. You as a believer, your citizenship is in heaven. The fact is, you know, you are just visiting this planet. There is far more to life than this life. There's more to what we have in the here and now. And Paul says, think about that. If you keep reading in Philippians, and it's, it's worth chasing down, the Apostle Paul frames your identity in the context of, of waiting for Christ to come back. So uh, Philippians 3.20 says, what do we do? We eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. In other words, when you start thinking about heaven, like when you wake up in the morning, you're like, I wonder if Jesus is coming back today. It changes you. Why should you do that? Well, Paul actually answers that back in Colossians 3. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. Why? Well, because that's the reality of things. Because you died, it says. And your life is now, look at this, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You know, every once in a while you hear a story popping up about somebody who dies and leaves behind millions of dollars. And I, the stories I love reading are stories about people who, what was hidden. Nobody knew that they were rich. You, you got folks who lived a simple life, never really spent much money. This is, you, you put that up, Eric. This is a New York Times article, article about a 96-year-old secretary who uh, lived very, very simply. And uh, she saved something like $8.2 million. And she was rich. And it was hidden. That part of her life was a secret. Nobody saw it until she died. And they found out she was rich. That is a metaphor for Christians, right? People look at us and they think we're weak, insignificant, dishonored fools for Jesus. Because people can't see it. We are tied to the ruler of the universe and our future is reigning with him in glory. This, by the way, this, this discrepancy between the reality of things and what they look like, it also, I'll be honest, it caused a lot of tension in the Christian life because it, it becomes really easy to doubt God's power when you can't see it. It's like, Again, I, I know you guys are Eagles fans, so like, it's like when you watch an athlete who is healed from a successful surgery, but like they, they talk about your mental game, right? Like deeply embedded in muscle memory for Carson Wentz last year, for Ronald Darby, for Jason Peter. Like you think your leg isn't healed even though it is. So you limp through the game and you just like mentally, you think you're not there when you are. And that, that's what Christians do, right? Here's what we do. We limp through life when we don't need to. Because we got, our mental game is off. We don't think we're there when we are, and we are unwilling to let God's power take hold of us. And you know how that starts to change? Well, it all starts to change when you set your mind and your heart on things above. When you start thinking about, like, who Jesus is now, and where you're headed, everything changes. You start getting confidence and perspective. For Paul, that is the secret to a victorious Christian life, knowing that Jesus wins the victory. It is setting your mind on the future, going like, this may not be cool, but one day Jesus will make it all right. And when you do that, when you set your minds and hearts on the reigning of Jesus, and your future riches in heaven, you start to stress a little less about the little stuff. In fact, thinking about eternity, setting your minds on things above, has the potential to change every decision you make today. 
A little over 300 years ago, uh, Jonathan Edwards famously fleshed this out, resolved to listen to this verse, to at every moment think about the future. And it's worth Googling it. He made some resolutions that articulates it well. It's in old language, but this is what it might look like for you to set your minds above. Here's what Edwards said. He said, resolved to never do anything, which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Wow, right? Resolved that I will live so that I shall wish I had done when I came to die. Resolved to live so at all times as I think is best in my devout frame when I have the clearest clearest notions of the things of the gospel and the other world. Resolved, he says, to never do anything which I would be afraid to do if I expected it would not be above an hour before I would hear the last trump. I mean, can you, you just, it's, it's old, it's like literally 300 years old, but, but you can kind of see uh, the language and you could imagine where thinking about, like you're here and you're thinking about heaven Thinking about Jesus coming back, thinking about things above changes everything you do. And here's our problem. We as a culture don't like thinking about that. You know, this is a 1660. The famous mathematician scientist Belize Pascal wrote uh, an essay in Penises asking a very strange question. He asked, why do kings have jesters? And there he is, he's traveling to royal courts. And what he noticed is something very strange, that when he went to royal courts, there and only there, did he find mindless entertainment. Because you'd go to uh, a royal court and you'd find goofy-looking guys in strange outfits juggling and making jokes. And Pascal asks, why? Why is it, he asks, why do kings have entertainment? He says, Kings don't need entertainment. What are they trying to distract themselves from? They've got everything they want. They have resources. They can make a difference. And Pascal says they could, like, they could use their energy to like, help people or change things. And he says, I mean, you know who should have jesters? You should give starving, sick, starving peasants uh, entertainment. Like, again, Robert told me about this movie, Patch Adams. Like, shouldn't the sick kids be having the, cloud, the clowns, right? Kings, on the other hand, why do kings work so hard to escape reality when reality is so nice? Why do kings have jesters, he asks. And Pascal answers in 1660 that the reason why kings have jesters is that when you as a human being don't have the stress of working to survive, like when you don't have to look for your next meal when you're healthy, Pascal thinks you inevitably end up thinking about, well, the end of your life. He says, by default, when your needs are taken care of, when you got that quiet time, you by default start thinking about your end. And he says that is terrifying. Pascal says, when all you have is silence, when you don't have silence, and you've got to, in the privacy of your own head, you've you, you got to start thinking about the end. Pascal says, you've got two options. You either set your mind on things above, and you find joy and purpose in serving and loving and living in Jesus, and you're looking forward to your end in joy and glory, or, Pascal says, you have to come to grips with something really uncomfortable, your own rebellion and rejection of Jesus. Because you end up, as Paul David Tripp says, the human mortality rate is still hovering right around 100%, right? And uh, someday you're going to have to deal with it. And Pascal's thought, you know, for kings, people who didn't like silence, it was more convenient to hire a jester to sing songs, to tell stories, to juggle, to take your mind off of things above. It's easier to do that 
then have to deal with what happens when you die, Pascal says. Clearly, a lot of things have changed since 1660. Uh, the big thing that changed is that, look around, you are all kings. None of you have to worry about survival, right? I don't think any of you are worried about where your next meal is going to come from. I don't think. I, look at the schedule if you're worried about it, <laughs> right? All of you have an ability to make a difference in your world. I don't think any of you are sick, poor, or dying. The tragedy of our generation, though, is like, think about this. No other generation in world history have had as much resources, influence, or power, right? And we spend almost all of it on hiring jesters and entertainment, and we gravitate towards setting our mind on the news, TV, books, music, Netflix, sports, social media, like you name it. And we as a culture are working really hard to innovate, to work at finding brand new ways of never having to sit in silence because if you do, you might have to ask the big questions about meaning, your future, and destiny in this life, which is, by the way, I think is why folks like you coming to a place like this is so powerful because hopefully you get an escape from all sorts of diversions and you and start setting your minds on things above. Because the Apostle Paul says the path to living in Jesus begins with setting your mind, your heart, your thoughts habitually and constantly thinking about Jesus' kingdom and your future in heaven. What do you do to connect with Jesus in all the ways Paul talks about, how do you do it? What do you do to claim and start living out of all these just I mean, massive promises that the Apostle Paul has made in the first couple chapters? It starts off by thinking about things above. And maybe it looks like just habitually thinking, introducing into your thought patterns, like, uh, but Jesus is in charge as part of your self-talk. Maybe it looks like actively thinking about the joys and glories of heaven. Or maybe it starts with Jonathan Edwards, right? What's he doing? He, he wakes up every morning and thinks about death in an empowering way. Here's something I learned. I, um, you know, I was a youth pastor. I was in youth ministry for about 10 years. And then I was called to help lead uh, what they described as an older, dying, traditional church. And uh, they asked me to come in and revitalize it a bit. And the last five years have been really fun. God has really blessed us. But the really, I mean, honestly, the hardest thing about what I had to do was I had to learn how to do funerals. We, we didn't really do that a lot in youth ministry. And when we did, they were terrible. But I would play golf poorly with guys, became friends with them. And then I did, I did 12 funerals in my first year at Goshen. And they're tough. And what's hard about funerals, right, uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody is going to die, but most of us never think about our funeral. And every time I, I do a funeral, I, I, I have to think about it. You're probably going to have a funeral, right? What's it going to be like? What kind of stories will people be telling about you? Who's going to show up at the wake? What kind of impact, legacy, influence, and memories will you leave behind you for those watching? What will God say about you? Like, we don't like, like you're all squirming, this is great. <laughs> we, we like to avoid these questions, right? We, we, we don't want to think about this, right? Uh, is uncomfortable. But what if, instead of avoiding those questions, what if, you were motivated out of them? What if you could start living each moment this week asking those questions? What if you could start thinking and start focusing on how to make an impact for God in such a way that it would change eternity? 
And imagine, imagine the way that that might change your life. Actually, you, you may not have to imagine it because next the Apostle Paul starts getting into the weeds and starts talking about some really specific things that would change in your life if you would start thinking and setting your mind and heart on heaven and on the rule of Christ. And I, I don't have time to talk about it. Just read it, right? Uh, but let me just ask for right now. If it starts to sink in that you've been raised with Christ, and if it really hits you that you have a future and a purpose in heaven for eternity, shouldn't we all act and live differently? Let's pray. So Father in heaven, can you give us the faith and the courage to think about things above? May you give us hearts that are tender toward you. May you give us the courage to think about things above and give us the insight to know how to live now in light of eternity. May you encourage us, may you comfort us as we read scripture this week. Can you open the eyes of our heart that we may behold wonderful things from your law? Can you teach us your ways? Can you show us who you are? I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much again, Elizabeth Welty, Bill's daughter-in-law. In fact, you know, this was a, a cool week for you. You celebrated an anniversary with, with Jan. Well, that's good that it was with Jan. Yes, well, you know. 47 years, I can't believe it. Wow. I'm getting old. It's awesome. So happy anniversary. Well, thank you, Robert. You can and, send uh, your cards to me. <laughs> with a donation for the Family Freedom Walk. Oh, wow. That's which awesome. is coming up. It is. Just a... Two weeks away? I know. It's going to be an awesome day. We're raising funds for the Ministry of Addiction Recovery. And if you've not sponsored somebody for the walk, you can sponsor Robert. You can sponsor Bill. You can sponsor Tyler. You can sponsor Zach. And it all goes to help us with the Ministry of Addiction Recovery. You can call 1-800-453-7942 between the hours at 8 and 4 and make your gift. Or you can do it right online at www.americaskeswick.com. Dot .org We appreciate you joining us. 
Wednesday and Fridays at 2.30. I trust that you'll join us on Monday at 1.30 for Worship Live with Robert and Joyce Hayes. God bless. Have a great weekend. If you enjoyed today's podcast, let us know. Write us at bewealthy at americaskeswick.org or it'll be in the description below. If you'd like to learn more information about America's Keswick, you can visit our website at www.americaskeswick.org. Join us every Wednesday and Friday at 2.30 for the next edition of the podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Tyler. And have a good and godly day.